Chapter 5 Dizzy I looked around the meeting hall in the village council building and wondered what speech Tupolev could possibly give that would apply to all of us. Usually Kolkonosics and villagers had separate meetings, but here we were all together. Peter and his father were in the front row, and Ruslana sat a row behind me with her father and sister. My whole family, including Auntie and Tanya, took up an entire row in the middle of the audience. Tupolev walked up to the podium. I've been ordered to read you Stalin's speech from the March 2nd edition of Pravda. His eyes nervously darted around the room. He held up the newspaper and his hand shook. It's called Dizzy with Success. I'd seen Tupolev look blustery and angry, bossy too, but nervous about reading a speech? That was new. The speech itself was long and windy, and as Tupolev read it, I understood why he was nervous. Stalin blasted the shock workers for all their violence. I looked over to my father and whispered, So, stealing property and killing people wasn't Stalin's plan? Murdering our priest? That wasn't approved by Stalin? Tato whispered back, that's what it sounds like. Anger was building up within me. I looked around the audience. Others looked angry as well. Someone behind me shouted, So you didn't have to steal so much from us? You didn't have to kick us out of our homes? The room became still. Ruslana called out from behind us, We want a new priest. Someone else shouted, Rebuild our church. This is your fault, Tupolev, someone shouted from behind me. Tupolev's eyes darted around the room. Let's kill Tupolev, shouted someone from the back. After that, it was pandemonium. With people shouting and knocking down chairs, half a dozen people rushed up to Tupolev, but Tato held me back when I tried to do the same. Tupolev made a run toward the back exit, but Taras Petrov, my teacher's husband, tackled him to the ground. You destroyed our community, he said, punching him in the face. Other villagers crowded in, but Comrade Berkovich jumped up from his seat and blocked them from getting to Tupolev. Fyodor rushed up to assist his father, and the two of them pulled Petrov off Tupolev. An angry crowd formed around Berkovich, Fyodor, and Tupolev. Berkovich shouted, Go home now. What's done is done, but we'll stop forcing people into the coal house. Mama's hand gripped my elbow. Let's get out of here. I want my Tachka back, said Auntie Paulina to the group of villagers who had gathered around outside after the meeting. The mayor isn't yours anymore. Berkovich said, what's done is done, said a voice at the back of the crowd. I'm going to the coal house, said Auntie Polina. Who'll come with me? It won't work, said Petrov. What if Tupolev calls in the army? Mama made her way through the crowd, not with pushes and shoves, but with, excuse me, and please. When she got up beside her sister-in-law, Mama whispered something into her ear. Auntie Paulina nodded and whispered something back. Then they stood side by side up at the front, staying silent. Mama raised her hand. The sight made me smile. She looked like a student wanting to ask a question in class. Mama kept her hand patiently raised and waited for people to notice her. It took a minute or so for that to happen, but soon the chattering stopped. Mama spoke in a low, calm voice. We have a plan. She lowered her hand, then gestured to Auntie Paulina. Auntie stepped in beside Mama and said, The women and girls will go in first. A gasp rippled through the crowd. But you could be hurt, a man shouted. The Kolskonics won't feel threatened by women, said Auntie Paulina. We'll go in together first. The men and boys will follow us. The crowd erupted into excited chapter. Mama raised her hand and waited. The chatter gradually stopped. If you're in favor of this whole plan, can you please raise your hand? Every person raised their hand. Sisters, said Auntie Paulina, go home now, get a broom or a rake or a pot. No form of protection more threatening than that. Brothers, bring your muskets. If the women and girls are attacked, we would appreciate you defending us. But if we're not attacked, we would appreciate you standing by. Go quickly, said Mama. We need to storm the coal house now before Tupolev has a chance to organize a defense. After all these weeks of powerlessness, there was hope in the air. Maybe we really could turn back time and regain some of our old way of life. I ran all the way home, excited at the prospect of getting Chacha back for Auntie and their cow and chickens too. And what about her house? I was looking forward to seeing Chort out of there. 
Auntie bundled Tanya to her chest by swaddling her snugly in a long floral scarf. You're taking the baby with you? I asked Auntie, alarmed at the thought of my little cousin in such danger. Chort killed my husband when I was in the village square and he was at home. I want our family to stay together. Yes, said Tato. We have strength in numbers. Mama carried her shovel, Auntie carried our broom, and Yulia brought along a soup ladle just in case. We only have one musket, said Tato, taking our ancient gun down from its place above the rafter. I took the frying pan, and Slavko found a big stick. We were ready. As we marched down the street toward the coal house, neighbors joined in, the women and girls marching up front and the men and boys staying in the back. The gate was open when we got there, and Ruslana stood beside it with her sister and father. We're not going to fight you, she said, gesturing with her hands for the women to enter. The women and girls fanned out, some going to the stables and barns, others entering the sleeping quarters and kitchen. I stood just outside with the other boys and men, on the alert in case it was a trick, letting the women in so easily. I didn't think Ruslana's family would do something like that. But a lot of my neighbors had done unexpected things lately, so we had to be careful. I found my soup pot, said Comrade Petrovna, coming out of the kitchen, a giant metal cauldron, blackened with age, clutched to her chest with one hand, while she shook her broom with the other. A woman came out behind her, holding a wooden stool over her head. My grandfather made this before I was born, she said. I'm grateful to have it back. Other women came out, dragging sacks of grain and other foodstuffs, stacking it all in front of us men and boys. Then Auntie Paulina came out from the stables with a stricken look on her face. Tasha's not here, she said. My horse is also missing, said another woman, coming out of the stable moments after Auntie Paulina. I want to help them, I said to Tato, handing him my frying pan. Go ahead, said Tato. The Kolskaniks won't think you're threatening. His words stung. Yes, I was just a kid, but did he have to rub it in? When I got closer to the stable building, I noticed the pattern of the individual wood slats. Normally I wouldn't pay such close attention to the individual slats, but we had just recently finished rebuilding our own barn, so I was curious about how the Kolskaniks made theirs. Instead of using one kind of wood, this stable had a variety. A lot of the barn boards had been newly cut, but they had also repurposed old wood. I ran my finger along one long, dark plank and wondered where it had come from. As I stepped inside the stable, the sharp smell of old urine made my eyes sting. Had no one cleaned these stables? I covered my mouth with my shirt and took a few steps farther in. There were horses in some of the stalls, but most of them were empty, save for old straw and manure on the floor that looked like it had never been shoveled out. The last stall was cleaner than the others, but still in disgraceful condition. I recognized the horse, Magda Polyak's Brody. He stomped his hoof and snorted when he saw me walk toward him. How are you, boy? I asked, holding my hand up so he could smell me, and then giving him a good scratching on his brow. I hate that he's here, said a girl's voice, startling me. You're Anya, right? I asked. There were six Polyak children, and they were close in age. No, she said, frowning. I'm Jenya. Can you take Brody home with you so he can get some fresh air in your pasture? I think he'll die if he stays here. Let me talk to your mother, I said. Do you know where she is? I'll find her, said Jenya, scurrying away. While I waited, I got some clean hay for the horses and put water in their troughs as well. As I set hay in one of the stalls, I noticed an unusual slat of wood close to the floor. I squatted to get a better look. The slat looked dark with age, but there was something sparkly too, like flecks of gold. All at once, I realized what I was looking at. It was a length of wood from the shattered icon of St. Sophia from our church. The sight sickened me. It was bad enough that they'd torn down our church, but to treat the fragments of our cherished icon like this, it was blasphemous. I would have tried to calm myself by taking a deep breath, but that wasn't possible in this urine-soaked stable. So instead, I pummeled a plain strip of barn board with my fists and said some bad words. That didn't calm me down. And unfortunately, it scared the horses. That made me feel even worse. 
I ran out of the barn and took deep, gulping breaths of fresh air as soon as I could. Niall, said Magda Polyak, Jenya tells me you'll take Brody home with you and help get him healthy again. What's going on with the horses, I asked her. The horses from the village were taken to Kharkiv to work in construction, she said. When we complained, they brought back some horses, but they were a mix of horses from various villages. Is no one looking after them, I asked. The job often gets skipped because there are so many chores, and people here don't know these horses. I look after Brody because he's my own horse and I love him. But by the time I get to him, it's often past midnight. I'll take him, I said. What about the others, she asked. They need help, too. Some of the horses were left at the coal house, but only those were a specific Kolkosnik promise to look after them. The rest were divided among the villagers to nurse back to health. The same happened with the cows and chickens, which were just as neglected. The padlock was hammered off one of the silos, and villagers filled pots and sacks and shawls with grain. Some people who had a place to go moved out of the coal house, but other people decided to stay. Ruslana stayed, and that surprised me at first. But she explained that their old house was uninhabitable since it had been repurposed into a storeroom. The pitch had been kicked out, and the windows now had bars over them. The people who were remaining with the coal house are now doing it voluntarily, she said. Hopefully that means we'll start to work together. Most of the city shock workers had fled after Stalin's speech was read, but Tupolev and Short stayed. Smart, Berkovich, and Halyadanya also stayed because they were locals. Chort refused to leave Auntie and Uncle's house, which I didn't think was fair. What I would like to know, said Mama, is whether we'll be able to work our own fields without interference. At least you have fields, said Auntie Paulina. A couple of days after the sisters' march, Comrade Berkovich called for a meeting out in the open in the market square. As we all stood around, Berkovich stepped on a chair. I was born and raised in Filivica, and you all know me. I hope you know that I have your best interests at heart. This opening remark was mostly received in silence, although a few people booed. The government wants to send in the army to pacify the village. We need to show that we don't need to be pacified. I pledge to you that if you want to farm on your own, please do so. If you want to join the coal house, we can farm together. Tattle raised his hand. If we farm our own land, will you interfere? If you farm on your own, everything will be like before, said Berkovich. You'll pay your taxes and sell the surplus. Stalin's goal is that we have a good harvest this fall. And what about if we're on the coal house? Asked Ruslana's father, Comrade Olnik. You'll get paid a wage and you'll get fed and have the right to use the coal house facilities, said Berkovich. Auntie Paulina stepped forward. Forward. Comrade Short took my house. My fields have been confiscated too. I demand my land back. Berkovich looked at her and frowned. That house is Chort's now, he said, and the land belongs to the coal house. There's no way you'd be able to farm it on your own anyway. You're not getting it back. You allowed my husband to be murdered, and you allowed my land to be stolen, said Auntie Paulina, and yet you claim to be looking after my interests? Berkovich put his hands on his hips and gave her an angry glare. It seems that no good deed goes unpunished. Chort wanted your family deported as kulaks. The reason your husband got killed is because he fought with Chort. I stepped in myself to make sure that you and your daughter were not deported or killed. I'm sorry about your husband, but I can't get your fields back or your house, Paulina. But just once, I wish someone would simply thank me for keeping them safe. Auntie's mouth hung open and her eyes were wide. I could tell that this conversation wasn't going the way she'd planned. Thank you, Simon, she said. I do appreciate you keeping us safe. Berkovich hopped down from the chair and paced, then shook his fist at all of us. We have to stop this rebellion. There have already been reports filed by the shock workers who fled back to the city, but I've contacted the authorities myself and calmed them down. I told them that everything is under control. If they come here and it's not, we'll all be in trouble. I propose that we do as Comrade Berkovich suggests, said my teacher, Comrade Petronova. Thank you, Comrade, said Berkovich. He looked out at all of us and said, If you agree, please raise your hand. Everyone that I could see raised their hand. Good, said Berkovich. Let's grow grain.